Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. Joined across the table from me is Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Hey, y'all. Hey, there he is. Um, it's uh, If you're watching YouTube, it's a little different this week. We are foregoing a video for this week just because um, we're in the middle of a move, as we kind of mentioned last week, right? Yeah, uh, and it's, we're trying to keep things lightweight so we can actually make sure to get a show out. Because for people right. that don't know, it does take a lot of time to figure out like where we source videos from, writing notes, kind of Nick and I doing silly voices back and forth across the table. It, the process it's a lot of effort we do put a lot of effort into that youtube uh presence so we are keeping it lightweight uh until we find a new home but until then the audio version should be mostly the same uh, i do know that the audio quality took a little bit of a hit but you know you can still listen to us it's okay we're, we're gonna work on that too we're, it's like i said we're lightweight we are nomads in this podcasting world for the next couple episodes. Short just growing until, pains. Yeah, short growing pains just until we get back up on our feet. You know how it is, but thank you for sticking with us through the through thick and through thin. Uh, we do have some exciting news stories to talk about this week, and uh, we're taking some questions from you guys, the community. Uh, so up for news, we got AI detecting heart failure from one heartbeat with 100% accuracy. I don't know, we'll see about that. We'll see. Absolutely. We'll see. Paris is testing flying taxis as a future city of transport, uh, future of city transport, and Google is saying AI detects 26 skin conditions as accurately as dermatologists. So we are getting a lot of AI stories this week when it comes to diagnoses. Absolutely. And our favorite, Big Brother. <laughs> but first, uh, every Victorian's driver's license uh, to be uploaded to a database. Um, but first... But first, that's a Julie Chen reference. If anyone's listening that listens to watches Big Brother, Julie Chen always entices the audience with some like hanging thing about what's going on with the television show. And they go, but first, oh, it just hits you goes into something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like I said, we're on YouTube. We are, um, you know, we're we're uh, we're hanging out. Uh, and like I said, thank you for sticking with us during the nomadic times before the empire. Uh, but Blake, I, I wonder what's going on with you. What's going on in Blake's world since we last talked? Man, it feels like it's been a long time, and I guess it has. It's been like probably a week? week uh, a and week half? and a half. Yeah, yeah we recorded on a Thursday, and then we skipped last week because we couldn't find a uh, time that worked for both of us, and it was just crazy. And then now we're back. We're here Monday nights. We're back again. Back at it one more time. You know, I don't have a whole lot of like great technology stories. Um, or anything that's super human factors related, but you brought up something I thought I hadn't thought about, obviously, in a couple of months of pre-ordering Google Stadia. Now, I had like totally forgot that this was even a thing. So I was going to throw it out there and see if any other audience members are going to do the same. Because one thing that I really like about like video games and all that stuff is playing with people. Yeah. People that I know. Yeah, so for sure. If you're part of the Human Factors Army, right? Uh, like, hit us up. We, we would be, we'd love to, to play on that platform with you, especially because it's so pick up and go. It's easy. And uh, with a lot of the infrastructure built into YouTube, we could potentially like do our after show on YouTube and then just say, anyone who's listening, you can literally click this link and be in playing with us, which is yeah. rad. It's, it makes it super simple. So it'd be super cool to know, like, if anybody's got any kind of thoughts or opinions on it, because Nick over here is definitely convincing me that it's a good idea. Um, but the more people we have on it, the more we can play with, it's uh, probably more likely that I'll be doing it. Yeah, let it, we, we should start a Stadia group on our Slack. In fact, um, I'll do that right after the show, and I'll, I will. Uh, I will make a little mental note for myself right now. Um, I'm going to start a Stadia group on the Slack channel. So if you're interested, let me know. Send me a DM or Blake a DM, and, and we'll get you into that group. Um, and yeah, it'll it'll be good times. It'll be Absolutely. good times. Absolutely. So Nick, what's going on with you, man? I know you got a lot of big things happening in your life. <laughs> yeah, I do have a lot of big things going on in my life. Uh, chief among them right now, we are prepping for baby. Um, and we had baby shower this weekend. And so here's, here's the thing, Blake. Um, there is, uh, technology allows us to basically pull the people that we want to come to these things. 
as would you like to come? And this is known as RSVPing. Yes. <laughs> Electronically. <laughs> Electronically. And um, let me just remind everybody that it's common etiquette to, if you RSVP, to come to something. Or if you can't make it, let the host know. Because Absolutely. RSVPs inform a lot of things, like how much food you get, or how many chairs you decide to rent from a company, or um, you know what type of uh, facility you need to rent for size reasons. Sure. Okay? Um, so yeah, we invited 35 of our closest friends, and about 25 showed up. So we had 30%, which is about average, I read online. You know, you, you anticipate about 20 Five percent, um, so it's a little more than average. But still, I think common etiquette should be: you RSVP, and if you can't make it, you notify. Now, Blake, you were not there. I was not there. But, I am one of the guilty twenty-five. But but here's the thing: you notified me. You I notified did. me via text, yes. and it's okay. It's okay. I forgive you. I and, so appreciate. And it. you had a great reason, and I really appreciate that because uh, you know my my newborn niece of a month is, was there and. Didn't want to get her sick. Oh, I didn't even think about that. So I was just, I'm like in my head, all I could think about was Justine. Yeah. Like the last thing I could do is like want to get that can be around Justine when she's pregnant. That's yeah. like, so like enough on top of everything. There were young children there, so it's probably good that you didn't show up. So yeah. that's that's why I said thank you for being courteous, uh, and I really do appreciate you reaching out. But geez, guys, if you're going to RSVP to something and you can't make it, as soon as you know that you can't make it, just Make, just let the person know who's hosting. Believe me, they don't care. They just want to make sure that they're ordering. So anyway, my point with that is that I got pizza for weeks, and lasa <laughs> pizza, lasagna, and, and salad for weeks, and cake, because there's so much stuff left yeah. over. And it was like a lot of wasted money on extra food and stuff that just, ah, uh, anyway. So uh, one thing I have kind of really, I, maybe I'm just paying attention too much to like different technology things that like save me, so one thing that's in, that would be interesting to know is from this, the system that you use for sending out RSVPs, did it send people reminders like en enough ahead of time for them to be like, oh, shit, I can't actually make it. I should probably un-RSVP. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know if the system manually does it. So we used Evite. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if the system manually does it. I think you might be able to sign up for reminders, like opt in. Sure. Um, I yeah. mean, it does notify you whenever somebody posts something in the event. So, like, we would post, you know, information, hey, we're a week away. Yeah. Uh, and here's some additional details just as, like, a push reminder. Um, so we were pushing details out. Okay. So, um, the, yeah, it's not enough of an excuse, right? Yeah. People just, like, forgot until the very last second had other things going yeah. on. Yeah. I, and I was, like, sending stuff out the day of, like, hey, here's the, here's the entrance that you're going to use. Here's a picture of it. Send it out. And maybe that's when people would go, oh, yeah, sorry, I can't make it. Like, you know, whatever. Sure. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, well, dang. Tech gonna, can't solve those problems. Yeah, if you're just uh, going to RSVP, just, you know, let the person know. Be be a little polite. Do it. <laughs> be polite like Blake over here. That's that's the um, that's the moral of the story. Big bucks of the story. Oh, man. All right. Well, you know what time it is, Blake. It's time for us to get into... Uh, Human Factors News. I don't know if I should. I, I can talk about this part. Yeah, I can talk about this. Hey, it's Human Factors News. This is the part of the show where we talk all about uh, Human Factors. This could be anything from medical privacy. We got some security in there. Some uh, AI is in there a lot this week. Uh, medical. Flying taxis. Flying automation. You name it. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors air game for us to talk about. All right, Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, up first. So doctors can detect heart failure from a single heartbeat with 100% accuracy using a new artificial intelligence-driven neural network, according to a recent study published in the Biomedical Signal Processing and Control Journal. So the study shows that AI can quickly and accurately identify a chronic progressive condition affecting the way in which blood is pumped around the body, also known as CHF, by analyzing one electrocardiogram or an EC heartbeat. The researchers claim that the clinical practitioners and health systems urgently require efficient detection processes as a result of the high prevalence and mortality rates and sustained healthcare costs of the EHF diseases. So this is 
I don't know, Nick. We talked a little bit about this when we started just based off the headline. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the big elephant in the room here is the 100% accuracy. Um, and it may be 100% accurate in their tests, but what does that accuracy look like when it's extrapolated to the public and it started to being used? I mean, like, it's very promising. Don't get me wrong. It's very promising. And, um, you know, even in test studies like that is that that is amazing numbers um but again like when you apply that to the public from one heartbeat i think the interesting thing to me is that we are getting so much information from so little data like oh yeah they're talking about one heartbeat here and they're talking about diagnosing this chf this chronic progressive condition um for how blood is pumped around the body and so that's great i think you know with even more data could, could is it even if it's not 100 percent accurate when it goes to the public at one heartbeat is it 100 percent accurate with two heartbeats you know like yeah there's more data doubling it's gonna be yeah. likely more accurate even if it's not at 100 percent with just the one right it's i mean it, it's crazy that they're using these neural networks to kind of analyze these heartbeats and to deduce these types of diagnoses with them. That's, that's incredible. Uh, and, and I mean, we're going to talk about some of the other diagnoses here a little bit later on with the dermatology. But um, yeah, I, I just find it fascinating how these neural networks are basically finding stuff that we can't even detect ourselves. And we don't know how it's doing it. And that's the kind of scary part. But also the really intriguing part is that, um, you know, in the future, we could have just AI systems that are detecting a million different things in us that, you know, at early detection, we can solve a lot of problems. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think like the big thing here is that it's just, it's obviously overcoming what we typically do now, which is do like heart rate variability analyses. It's just going to take a lot more time. Like I think what the article says is they're actually using five minute excerpts for one specific heartbeat that be irregular to be leading to this CHF, right? Um, which it, in regular heartbeat analyses, they need 24 hours worth of work to kind of pull this information out and make a determination. So, I mean, the, the only thing that makes this even better is when they release it to the public, things like stories we, we've talked about in the past of how you know, the Apple Watch has been used right. to do something similar. Not, I don't think it's specifically CHF, but it may be just you know irregularities in the heartbeat heart attack i think was the cardiac arrest but imagine like releasing this you know neural network or ai out into just the apple software for instance one collecting bunch of a bunch of trend data from a lot of people but also to be like seeing how this thing works at scale does it does it have harder a harder time being accurate because there's just so much data to try and absorb or does is it able to keep up computationally so you don't really have to worry about the accuracy in this you just basically be having your watch to get to the hospital right yeah that i mean the the media miniaturization of technology and especially when it comes to processing power behind some of these algorithms that detect these types of um, disorders or, or diseases like that's that's the interesting thing to me. When you can put the power of a hospital on your on your wrist, uh, that's incredibly powerful. And um, you know, I'm back on my health data kick again now that I I'm using a different portal now. We've moved. We're under a diff different healthcare system, and so I'm trying to integrate all my like uh, fitness data into my healthcare data so that way it's all one integrated picture nice. I'm back on that kick again cool uh so it, it'll be cool though to like link that stuff up when when the information can pull from my medical records and it can pull from what's actually happening to me right now and say oh based on your medical history and what you're doing right now uh you should go see a doctor because of this thing and i think this is just one more thing you bring it up with like the uh capabilities of the apple watch you know it's just one more thing that miniaturized technology can detect, and that's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's pretty funny because, I mean, originally when Fitbits and all that kind of stuff came out, I couldn't imagine, like, really tracking any of my you know, own data or, or, like, workouts or any of that kind of stuff because this was, like, almost pre-me being big and 
active. But now, like, with all these kind of impacts that it can have, especially from, like, a health aspect for, like, thinking about my, my own parents or grand people with grandparents, like, it's putting one of these things on somebody's arm can serve multiple purposes, but in this case, it could potentially save somebody's life or have the chance of doing it. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get into this next story here? Yeah, absolutely. Flipping all the gears. So pollution is a major <laughs> issue issue for Paris, like many, many metropolitan cities. And the city's public transport system is bursting at the seams. But one startup has a solution called Bubble. The Bubble is a flying taxi powered by electricity and lifts out of the water on wings, quote unquote. So it's at around 200,000 pounds to build it, and it can reach up to speeds of about 18 knots, so 20.7 miles per hour. Test voyages in Paris are limited to a maximum of about 18.6 mile per, miles per hour, and the service could launch as early as next as spring next year. Paris is one of the densest urban population transport networks in the world, with more than 650 trains running simultaneously at rush hour and 4.7 billion Wow, billion trips made by public transport in the Paris region since 2016. That's pretty nuts, but this is a gr potentially great solution of one, bringing in automation, but bringing in something I'm a little more excited about of the flying car concept. Yeah, and so let's be clear here. This is this is just a hydrofoil. This is basically, um, for those of you who don't know, hydrofoil is basically a, a mechanism that pushes uh, a larger body up so that way it reduces drag and kind of increases the efficiency at which um, a water faring craft can travel so like you know you see this in um, uh, I, I know there are some passenger hydrofoils but basically it, it's it, the faster it goes it's traveling up on these like little stilts and because it's traveling above the water and you don't have the whole boat in the water it is not uh it's not going to create as much drag and so this uh this kind of gets at paris's whole um pollution issue right when they can create something that's that's as green as this device right or, or this this transportation module then uh especially in such a dense urban network right you're um it's providing another avenue for public transportation that wasn't previously there before and uh, it's it's greener than some of the other options provided. Absolutely. And it, it's an awesome design. I mean, just looking at the pod that's on top of the stilts, I mean, they're obviously really aerodynamic and I'm kind of surprised that it doesn't have like a max speed that's much higher than what they're projecting because it's tiny. Yeah. And it's electric powered. Tesla's any indication, you know, you can go pretty fast on one of those guys. But the, the one thing I do worry about is if this gets, gets like, you know, green lit and you can actually use it, does it like create an entirely new type of traffic jam and problem to sort through in the water for France? Because it, if you look at, if anybody's been to France or is familiar with, you know, architecture that is there, a lot of it, especially the bridges that are in the water are not going to be you know built or meant for like mass travel to be happening underneath them so you may change kind of infrastructure of the city which in some ways could be you know hard to see but it, it's a sweet technology solution that again is really getting at this green concept yeah have, blake have you seen uh some of the hydrofoils uh in hong kong oh honestly the first time i ever heard hydrofoil um, so I just sent you a link. Uh, there's a hydrofoil in Hong Kong that's like this massive kind of transportation thing. And it's weird seeing this gigantic uh, like yacht um, basically <laughs> hovering above the what? water. Uh, and it's like, yeah, they've got several different things, right? So I'm looking at a catamaran right now uh, where it's just hovering above the water at, at like this really knots. fast speed, right? Yeah, it's going very fast and carries a lot of people. And I'm wondering if this is just a limitation of Paris's canals um, and waterways. Be. Yeah, this is looking like they, there's no real bridges they're dealing with. Looks like they're going from almost like open water to open water. Right. right. But when you look at sort of this this uh, this video here provided to, with. Uh, Euro news. I mean, they're it's, it's showing you going under smaller bridges, and so you know to to be able to account for that, you may need 
a smaller profile boat. And I'm wondering if these are more like um, intended to be more like the the Uber or Lyft type devices where you summon it using an app, you hop in, it takes you to a destination point and then waits at that point for another, you know, person to go. And, you know, with enough of these on the water, you would effectively reduce the need for a larger boat that goes at some sort of scale. I'm going to refer to these as boats. I know they're hydrofoils. But I mean, um, if you think about, like, I don't know what's more efficient. Is it, I, I feel like the more efficient thing is to grab the bigger thing, transport everybody all at once, but maybe that's just not how the world works. And there, there needs to be this on-demand sort of um, point A to point B transportation solution that just wouldn't be possible with this massive bus, right? Because it's like, bus would have to stop every so often, um, where this, I can see it getting up and going and getting to its destination really quickly, you know, instead of having to wait for everybody to board. So there's almost less time waiting. I don't know. Like, you, you get the trade-off that I'm trying to get at here, right? Yeah, because it's either, like, if you go the Hong Kong route or something similar to it where you get a bus, like a, a really big boat, then you're, like you said, you're waiting for people to get on and off, but then it can only go to, like, specific points. It's kind of like taking a train. Yeah. You have you would have to hope that there's enough points along the route that would make sense to drop people off. Right. But going through a waterway, is there that many places that are already built within the infrastructure to be, like, letting right. people in and out? I don't know. Yeah, but little drop-off really, points. But I really like the idea that this could be like almost a, a hail ride service of some kind. Yeah, it still allows a lot of them to operate in this in this area and in the specific river that they have or they're they're, they're depicting in the article. Um, and then if it's and then I think like you said, it allows for a lot more of like pick up, drop off, next thing, next person, next set of people because it looks like it can carry I don't know four or five people. Yeah, I mean, you know, they say um, <laughs> they say the journey's not been all plain sailing. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, the problem here is that Paris River Police, they actually ordered this company to stop its activity. Oh, no. um, so there's that. But they are looking into other solutions in Switzerland and the US. So they're they're looking at other avenues. So it'd be cool if this type of thing existed here in the US. We don't have any major riverways near us, but uh, it'd be cool if, you know, we were on location at HFES one year and we got to try this out. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I would love that, right? Like, that'd be real cool. It w that would be amazing. But uh, it's, it's kind of too bad that, like, Paris has had to, or like the river police, as you mentioned, are tightening down on this, because like going through like the details about kind of Paris's regulations, like they are starting to ban even cars and I think some tankers with diesel. Mm -hmm. so I can only imagine. I, like I, I see the point in doing that. It makes sense. Like you have to, you have to find some proactive solutions that are like more immediate. But something like this of adding a new type of transportation that's electric, it's green, makes more sense in the long term than trying to get people to get rid of their, or clean up their own cars. I don't sure. know. There will always be resistance to change, I think. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, well, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. All right, and we are back. Before we go on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at VentureBeat. 
the age, Euro News and Forbes for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, uh, you can join us all over Slack or social media for links to the original articles. We do post those as we find them. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and move on? We got two more news stories up. Why don't we get into this next one here? Let's do it. So Google's yeah. at it again with some more AI. Skin conditions are among the most common kind of ailment globally. In fact, it's estimated that 25% of all treatments provided to patients around the world are for skin conditions, and that up to 37%... For skin conditions? <laughs> yep, indeed. And that up to 37% of patients seen in the clinic have at least one skin complaint. The enormous case workload and a global shortage of dermatologists have forced sufferers to seek out general practitioners who tend to be less accurate than specialists when it comes to identifying these types of skin conditions. So this trend motivated researchers at Google to investigate an AI system capable of spotting the most common dermatological disorders seen in primary care. In their paper, A Deep Learning System for Differential Diagnosis of Skin Diseases, they report that their DLS achieves accuracy across 26 skin conditions when presented with images and metadata about a patient case. And they claim that, it, that it's on par with the U.S. Board Certified Dermatologists. So the DLS may, in fact, augment the ability of general practitioners who did not have specialty training to accurately diagnose different There's kind of a lot to unpack here from Google putting AI into dermatology. Um, maybe the biggest one, like we had talked about with the one, the one heartbeat stuff, Again, another application of AI to help with diagnosis of something quickly. Um, but this also, in this case, feels like to me it's helping, helping more accurately diagnose things from a general practitioner point of view yeah. before you ever have to get to a specialist. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting, right? Can you imagine the day where you notice like some sort of rash on your skin and you take a picture of it and send it into a, an app and you have results within seconds? because it just goes through a deep learning algorithm and figures out you have a common rash. Like it's just a, you know, you sat on the boogie board too long, you know, whatever yeah. it is, uh, versus, you know, something a little bit more serious. So um, I think that's that's really cool. And, and I think it's exactly where it needs to be right now. We're kind of in the training the data phase. And the fact that it can, um, the fact that it can diagnose at the same level of accuracy as dermatologists is good but it's not 100 percent accuracy right that's i mean that's the very careful line that we're talking about here right it's diagnosing at the same level as dermatologists who can sometimes get things wrong doctors are subject to opinion as well absolutely and so uh you know once we surpass them then it's a question of well what do we do now and it's a very dangerous question of what we do now because we can't just like I, th there's this level of trust in automation, right? That the mental human factors works are, are, are centered around is this trust in automation. Absolutely. And this is a form of automation, is an automated uh, diagnosis machine. And one, you know, it, is the human that submitted their sample going to trust it, right? I send, I send a picture of my skin. Uh, am I going to trust something that comes back as accurate when it took seconds to look at you know do you build in some delay to help with the trust do you say it was reviewed by a dermatologist to build in trust if so then you're dealing with a second layer of trust does the dermatologist trust the uh ai system right that presumably the dermatologist has a level of expertise that they feel is is probably better than any computer can do but we've seen the opposite where the computers now have millions and millions of data points and they've seen more than the dermatologist has. And so really they're better at diagnosing. And it's this whole, okay, then what's the dermatologist role? Is it the supervisory? You know, and I feel like that's really where all the automation thing is going yeah. is the supervisory role until it gets good enough. And then those roles will drop off and you won't even need them anymore. And it's, it's weird, right? That's, that's weird to think about. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting. So I've never really thought about this line thinking, for a better way of putting it, until we've kind of gone through the story. I was listening to you talk through it. So for a very long time, I'm not really sure if I can mention the person, so I 
don't. But I, I know a specific friend of mine worked in medical device technology for like a very, very long time. And I mean, humans have been inherently bad at identification from, even if you're very well trained, like out from like an x-ray point of view, right. or like cancer. We, we've constantly been developing systems over decades to try and aid us in doing that. So I'm, I'm thinking that stuff like this, that yes, it's good for identification purposes, and right, maybe at some point that we won't really need the human. Maybe they'll, AI, like general intelligence will come to be lifetimes and we'll actually be able to see something that can create treatments over and above what we understand. Right. Um, but for now, I mean, having anything that one allows me, because this is kind of an interesting conversation for us both to have, because I know that like it's a trend with hey, millennials not to have like a primary doctor care. You don't really like go see your doctor. You just something's wrong, go get it checked out, and that's it. It's reactionary rather than proactive. Yeah, and preventative. Yeah. So I mean, in cases like that, if we can make a general practitioner that much more accurate, I think it's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I almost, when you were kind of talking through your thoughts of this specific application, my head went to, well, this could potentially bypass a general practitioner and all. If I take a, a scan of myself, whether it's like a skin condition, if I cough right. on my phone, if I, my heart rate hits whatever beats per minute or sends off some kind of like trigger warning that I might be having a heart attack, it's connected to your smartphone phone through Bluetooth. I mean, it could just put you in touch with the the best specialist that you need to be seeing whatever's going. On. Right. So if you, like you mentioned, if you took the picture, you just go see the specialist. You don't have to worry about like, okay, I'm gonna go see my GP and then figure out where I need to go from here. Right. It skips a bunch of steps. Yeah. And makes medicine more efficient. But I, like, I don't know. Like the the other sort of a exciting application to me is like. Maybe there's something that's treatable immediately. You can get something treatable immediately, and like once you link into other services, maybe, maybe you say like you send a picture, <clears throat> and it says like, hey, if there's a treatment available, send it to me. I don't care what it costs, just send it to me, uh, and it charges you twenty dollars for a copay linked through your insurance, and it arrives at your door the next day, yeah. and like it just automatically does that because you sent in a picture, and it gives you an ointment for whatever skin condition that you have, like. That's exciting to me too. Or it's very like Amazon pharmacy. Yeah, or it gives you like, it will maybe even order a prescription for you at your local pharmacy and they just get it for you the same day, which is also very cool, right? Like I have this rash from my device. You can see on my skin that it's kind of like a uh, rashy from the heart rate monitor on the, um, on the smartwatch, right? Yeah. And so, like, if I sent a picture of this in, they'd be able to tell, oh, that's this kind of skin condition. Uh, you need this type of lotion to treat that based on, you know, what we know about your skin. Uh, and that would be really cool. And, you know, it's like it lays out the treatment for you right there. It says, take off your smartwatch. We know exactly what this is because we've seen it before. Take off your smartwatch. Put this lotion on. Do not put your smartwatch on for five days, you know, or something like that. Uh, keep applying every five to ten hours and you should be good um, that's really cool to me uh, see you've, you've done it again you've like sparked a completely different line of thought related to this now I mean the thing that really like I'll, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and tried to read as much as I can understand about artificial intelligence and then what that means in contrast to between that and general artificial intelligence and I still really don't understand all of it but let's say that we or our lifetime is over we get to artificial general general artificial intelligence and we do have something that's able to think through and compute so much data that it's beyond and above whatever a human could do in that case of something like this especially for if if you're maybe you don't have to be diligent at this point but if you're tracking your fitness data through a, a fitbit maybe you're keeping track of whatever you're eating through your smartphone part that excites me about all of these kind of AI studies in healthcare is that maybe we get to a point where because AI is able to absorb so much information and then it also has very specific personal information about you, it can start recommending like, okay, what if you just change your diet for a couple of days? What if you remove something you've been 
show that based off of you've been having a lot of that leftover baby shower cake there we go why don't you cut down on that maybe that's why you're having a rash or whatever (laughs) so it could get past this like very this model i think that what we're really stuck in especially in america i can't speak for outside uh, yeah in international places very much like they're have symptoms, let's treat it with medication of some kind right. without looking at the whole problem of, the, of a person. It's reactive and not preventative. Again, yeah, you're right. And and so, yeah, you're, you're, what you're trying to get at here is can we get at that preventative medicine by using AI to analyze the shit that we're putting in our bodies or the way that we're moving throughout the day? Uh, and I think absolutely, I think we'll get there. Right. And, and maybe it just gets easier to the way you don't have to worry about are people being like reactive because if it's very like integrated experience in your life you're kind of always stuck in that proactive mode right yeah no that's, that's a cool story I, I really like this one I think we we hit some good discussion there um, we got one more story though unless you have any other closing thoughts on that one now let's get to every Victorian's worst nightmare all right let's talk about Big Brother but first <laughs> but first Okay, so the Victorian government will be updating driver's licenses data to the federal nas- federal government's national driver's license facial recognition solution in a bid to crack down on identity fraud. So the state has touted that the move will improve the, the way roads and police monitoring for fraudulent or duplicate IDs, and the upload will make it easier for authorized government agencies to identify fake licenses or multiple IDs connected with a single individual to stop that potential fraud. And current image-based identification methods are very cumbersome, and sharing information between these types of agencies takes days just to process. So the need agreement will help get dangerous drivers off the roads by reducing the chance of people using multiple licenses to avoid demerit points or license. But there is a lot going on, it sounds like, with using licenses for a lot of different reasons, because I've never really heard of, you know, make sure that I can still drive on the road or having a fake ID that. Um, but it sounds like, I mean, this should help cut down a lot of, like, the fraudulent things. But I still worry about some of the impacts of, you know, up loud privacy. Yeah, so look, like... There's been a lot of movements here in the States, at least, uh, for blocking the ability to build facial database, uh, facial recognition database software. Um, And a lot of it comes back to privacy. And I don't, maybe this is just the millennial in me, I don't know. But like, honestly, I would rather have a facial database where Somebody is caught on camera doing something bad. Like we talked about a crime on the bonus pod a couple weeks ago. It happened. If there were cameras around, they would have caught who was doing that if their face was matched in a database. You know? Yeah. Like to me, it, it's kind of the ultimate form of Big Brother, like literally watching everything that you do. But if you don't, the problem is the thresholds, right? If you're if you're speeding on the road and they log your face, what's the threshold there? I was one mile per hour over the speed limit. You gonna yeah. you gonna ticket me every time I do that? You know that I think is where you know like everybody kind of speeds on California highways at least. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so it's like, are are you going to write me a ticket every time that happens because you have cameras on the freeway? Or is it only going to be treated for like serious crimes or, you know, like it's this weird area where like you got to treat everything at this equal level. Yeah. And And there's no nuance. Really, it's It's a slippery slope. And so I get that. But at the same time, I would feel very protected if, let's say, you know, there was the threat or I don't I don't know how to explain this. Like, would there be less crime overall? in a city where everyone's watching your every move and it's reviewed by law enforcement like sounds scary but at the same time no one's going to come up to you and murder you on the street because they know cameras are watching and they'd get caught and sent to jail like i don't it's such a it's it's such a rock and a hard place for me conversation because on one hand i do get the safety and security aspect but at the same time i do get the privacy aspect and like 
Even if I broke the law, even just a little bit, one mile per hour over the speed limit, you're going to get me for that. Ah, I don't know. It's it's tough. Yeah, it's one of those that works in like the big, the raising, but it works in the macro cases of you killed somebody and we caught you doing it. There's no out. Um, it gets harder when we think about the smaller instances and how it treats it, how you get treated. Speed limit, if you jaywalked, whatever. Um, and so, and who knows, maybe you could put in rules in place to kind of handle some of that stuff. But, and I'm, I'll be honest, I'm kind of surprised, and maybe this is a state, not a federal level, so this could be the pushback is surprising because I, I feel like government stands to make a lot of money from having facial recognition running around for stuff like ticketing. Well, they do. And that's why a lot of, some figures in government are, are, pushing back because they understand the right for privacy. They understand that not everybody wants this and it's, we're not ready for it as a society yet, I think is the biggest thing, right? Yes, it does offer all that stuff, but are we ready for it? I don't know. I don't think we are as humans, to be completely honest. And this, this is like a funny instance of it, or it's, it's really not that funny if you think about it, but so ultimately this is, this stuff would be recorded and it'll, You'll like you're, if they're going to use facial recognition, they're going to have to have a for now enough video time and enough video cameras going and recording that they can perform matches. Now, there's plenty of software solutions for like getting like pulling in data, checking it, and getting rid of it. But ultimately, somebody may end up having to watch a system or watch you know video all the time. Something was flagged as a crime. Yeah, and so now now you've got people that are. Con constantly potentially watching situations that they don't need to be watching right so there's that odd kind of privacy problem there um but two i mean on the flip side of that is the like the use of this kind of video stuff for blackmail like let's say it's not illicitly a crime that you've done but you i don't know you ha there's a video of you being somewhere that you see. right it, from like a social perspective has nothing to do sure. with you breaking a law yeah, you uh, said you'd be at my baby shower and... I was you, off skateboarding. You were at Galaxy's Edge or something. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. stuff like that, it's like, okay, at the small level of Blake and Nick, who cares? That doesn't really matter. At the big level care, of... because you RSVP'd. That's true. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but at, like, the big level of, you know, presidents or governors or just, like, people that have a lot of... Those checks. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's kind of, and again, maybe that's a good thing to have that. Maybe there's not as much corruption that sits around the world. Monitoring, monitoring. stuff all the time. But, but I, who, I still think they escape it. It's the it's the whole who watches the watchmen. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, well. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's a great note to end all on. All that from driver's <laughs> license pictures. Driver's uploaded. license. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into this last section here. All right, so this is It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the fact field of human factors and, uh, you know, encourages discussion amongst the community. We can talk about it. Uh, we got one this week. This is uh, from user Better Tax, and this is from the user experience subreddit. Uh, this is... Best free UX software. And this is more of like a just PSA for everyone. If you are looking for tools that are free that you want to try out, I thought this was a good Reddit post to just kind of get you started. Um, this this person, Better Tax, asks, would love to hear about someone who has tried them all. Uh, best free UX software, in your opinion. No trials. I know Adobe XD, Envision, Studio, and I'm sure there's others. And I think some of the other comments on this one are um, not necessarily free here, but like Sketch plugins. So if you have Sketch, there's a lot of different plugins that you can use. 8% are actually worth your time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, Figma is one of these. I haven't heard about Figma. Have you heard about Figma? Yeah, that, was, that would be one that I would recommend, and I recommend it um, when 
when people are starting the classes that I teach for UX Academy. Okay. Um, just because, like, for now, Figma's growing leaps and bounds, so it probably won't stay, like, free-tiered forever because it's, it's, ba- it's, a, it's a cloud solution. So everything's mm-hmm. done within the browser. Your projects live in the browser. Um, but the tools are just great. I mean, it mimics what you would get in Sketch, so it's very similar to that. It's not as powerful as, like, an AI or, like, Photoshop or something like that, but it gives you, like, enough of the baseline to start with and since on the web, like you, you can grab stuff from like CSS and you can get like fonts from Google and all that kind of stuff, and it's pretty easily integratable. Yeah, um, I'm looking at kind of this like overview video, and it's pretty impressive. I'm not gonna lie, this is really cool looking. And it's great for like the collaborative aspect if you can work with cloud tools, or even if you're in an enterprise software company, they have options for that. Uh, because like the collaboration aspect is kind of what makes Envision great or did like at the beginning for sure of like being able to share a project online let people leave comments on it well in this case it's a similar idea where you can create your prototypes and everything and people will leave you comments and feedback on it that's a great tool for sure that's great uh adobe xd have you used much of adobe xd i haven't used a whole lot of it um i know a couple designers that do and they they love it some people it's it's like any product really i mean there's some people that just are diehard fans of it right um i know it's it's supposed to be pretty good for the prototyping aspect of things like making your mock-ups come to life a bit yeah uh i'm gonna recommend one that's not technically free but i recommend it every time Gimp? Well, no, that's, I mean, I guess, yes, Gimp is fine. Yeah. It's a good Photoshop alternative if you don't <clears throat> want to pay for Photoshop or Adobe Cloud. Absolutely. Uh, I will say, the one I was going to say uh, is not necessarily free, but it is included in a lot of your software packages. That's Microsoft PowerPoint. Yep, that's true. You do recommend that one all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do. And it's like, look, if you're a human factors practitioner, if you're a designer, it might be a little different, right? If you need something a little bit more polished... Uh, PowerPoint might not be your tool of choice, but if you need to show kind of how to get from point A to point B to the golden path, uh, PowerPoint can be amazing. Yeah. Um, PowerPoint can also hook up, you know, some some pretty simplistic visualizations if you're trying to convey a concept. Um, I think PowerPoint is is a more powerful tool than people realize, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna two PowerPoints horn one more time because I think it's I think it's great. Well it's consistently adding features too that are more design heavy. It so is. So I mean I think I think at some point that could be Microsoft's solution for design stuff. If they start like allowing you to kind of like put artboard type stuff in there, like design for specific screens and then it's a click through it's not that far away from it's it. not. It's really not. Like yeah. they could do a PowerPoint plug in or something or a uh, PowerPoint plus. PowerPoint plus or yeah it's like Power design, Microsoft Power Design or something, you know, like, and just use the PowerPoint base and just, yeah, there's, there's, it's not far off. And I think it could be included in Office and it would be good. Um, So anyway, that's, that's all I got for you. You got anything else? Yeah. One more that I think is fun if you are somebody who's into design, but wants to learn a little bit more about code, but are intimidated or don't know where to start. Uh, One software solutions against a cloud deal is Webflow. So Webflow. It, yeah, so it kicks out a lot. Like, you can do a lot with Webflow besides just create designs and prototypes. You can actually, like, run your own website through them through their kind of, like, headless CMS program, which does cost money because they're hosting your website. Um, but it's pretty cool because it kicks out a lot of, like, CSS and structural things for websites. So you can tweak that and see what happens to your page and stuff like that. And you can also, I think, get into the nittier gritty stuff with some of the JavaScript interactions, or at least there's a way to do that. Um, So it's a great tool if you are somebody who likes to design, wants to learn how to design, but also like has an interest in understanding how code works or what, what we, what you're really talking about when talk with a developer and they're like, I don't know if that's going to work for, I don't know how to do that in CSS or whatever it may be. So here you go. Serve it up to them on a nice hot platter. Yep. Spank it on the bottom. Call it a design. Absolutely. (laughs) All right, well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Uh, Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. Uh, If you're a Patreon supporter, are we doing an after show this week? 
We got, we Let's got do an time. after show this week. Yeah. We're, stay tuned for the after show. We're going to do an after show. For the rest of you, uh, you can join the discussion on our Slack. And be sure to check out for that Stadia chat. We're going we're gonna to set that up. Remember, if you're, uh, if you're going to be on, on Stadia, join us. Join us. <laughs> it is your destiny. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what's going on anymore. He loves it so much. If you want to reach out to us, you can hit, hit us up at show at humanfactorscast.com. Uh, we do prefer those over all of the uh, the Reddit posts because it's hearing directly from you guys. If you like what you hear want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon because we can hang out with the after show. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for hanging out with me on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about how to RSVP for people's baby showers? Absolutely. If you guys want to talk about RSVPing for baby showers and not showing up, you can always find me at Don't Panic UX across all social media platforms. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing. When it looks good, when it looks like this, it is not Jeff. It is me messing it up every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. depends.